Trio Esteros, episode 67. If it's chains you want. Spoilers all books. Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm Lady Guinevere and with me, as always, is Yoke Boy. Yeah, hi there everyone and thanks so much for being here. Today we're going to give you an in-depth look at a highly relatable character many of us hold dear to our heart. It's Samuel Tarly. Yeah, we are very excited about this one. We're going to begin with a brief history of House Tarly, where we'll gauge the weight of expectation placed on Sam's young shoulders. Then we'll take a look at Sam's early years as he struggles and suffers under the formidable shadow of his hard and overbearing father, Randall Tarly. Next, we'll pick up Sam's story from his introduction in the training yard of Castle Black, analyse how Sam's prior treatment affected him from the outset, and follow his arc as he gains a POV and tries to overcome his self-confessed cowardice when he ventures north of the Wall on the Great Ranging. From there, we'll take a look at Sam's journey from the Wall to Old Town as he endeavours to look after Gilly and a baby while continuing his transition into manhood aboard the Cinnamon Wind. And when we finish looking at his story from left to right, examining his problems and growth along the way, we'll consider one of his key literary influences in J.R.R. Tolkien's Samwise Gamgee. And finally, we'll look to the future and contemplate what might be in store next for this wonderful character in The Winds of Winter and Beyond. It's a packed episode today, but before we begin, let's take a moment to shout out our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patron, Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Daniel, Joel I, the Three-Eyed Bro, Chris B, the Song of Ice, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Moltude, Scotty, and John Weirgarian as well as B-Word and Mr. J, the Bear and the Maiden Fair, and Sir Tim of House Jib Jab Hot Dog Shop. House motto, we forge the chains we wear in life. Thanks so much to all of you. And if you want to be a patron of the show, earn shout outs, an invitation to our private Discord, and access our patron exclusive content, please find us on patreon.com slash Radio Westeros. And now... It's time to get started with Samuel Tarley. The Tarleys were a family old in honour, bannermen to Mace Tyrell, Lord of Highgarden and Warden of the South. The eldest son of Lord Randall Tarley, Samuel, was born heir to rich lands, a strong keep and a storied two-handed greatsword named Heartsbane, forged of Valyrian steel and passed down from father to son near 500 years. House Tarly, with their sigil of a striding red huntsman on a green field, is an ancient house whose roots extend back to the dawn of days and the age of heroes. Their stronghold at Horn Hill and their lineage were said to have been founded by twin sons of Garth Greenhand, Herndon of the Horn, and Harlan the Hunter, who jointly took as a wife a beautiful woods witch whose powers were able to keep her husbands from aging for generations. Of interest, it seems that George may have been influenced here by the semi-legendary figure of Hearn the Hunter, who appeared in Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor as a horned huntsman who haunted parts of Windsor Forest. His origin in myth and legend prior to this are murky, but it's possible the horns indicate Hearn was some sort of mythical green man figure, possibly a leader of the wild hunt related to the Celtic horn god Cernonus, who was in turn a consort of an earth goddess similar to Herden and Harlan's association with the woods witch. All of which is to say that the association of House Tarly with hunters, the power of nature and general ferocity are very deep indeed. Though never kings in their own right, their close association with the heroes who founded the various kingdoms of the Reach and their long storied history have left House Tarly a proud house. In fact, the prestige of their origin story might be said to exceed that of their liege lords of House Tyrell, 
originally stewards to House Gardner of Andal origin. Certainly as marcher lords responsible for protecting the border between the Reach and Dorne, the Tarleys played a role in the wars and politics of the Reach for many centuries, with several prominent members being featured on the larger stage of Westerosi events. The first of these is Savage Sam Tarly, Lord of Horn Hill during the reign of Aenys I, son of Aegon the Conqueror. Savage Sam was a key figure in an event of the Second Dornish War known as the Vulture Hunt, a name possibly inspired by Lord Tarly's involvement. Savage Sam captured and executed the Dornish outlaw known as the Vulture King and also slew many of his followers with his Valyrian steel greatsword, Heartsbane. Then comes Lady Samantha Tarly, the fiery daughter of the Lord of Horn Hill known as Lady Sam, who became the second wife of Lord Ormond Hightower, who commanded the forces of the Greens in the Reach during the Dance of the Dragons. When Lord Ormond was killed at Tumbleton, his widow became the paramour of her late husband's successor and son, Lionel Hightower, whom she convinced to agree to the peace proposal of Corley's Valerian during the False Dawn, possibly because her own family had fought on the side of the Blacks. As shocking as her relationship with her former stepson was, Lady Sam became a leading figure in the Reach who went on to found the Bank of Old Town. She and Lionel were eventually allowed to marry and their six children were legitimised, so it's likely that all of the present Hightowers are descended from Lady Sam Tarly. And several generations later, there was a Samwile Tarly listed among the competitors at the tourney of Ashford Meadow. And if you're noticing a pattern here, yes, most of the Tarleys identified in the histories do share a form of the same given name as our point of view and the subject of this episode, as if to underline that notable members of House Tarly have been called Sam, setting up a weight of family tradition and expectations which will fall firmly upon the shoulders of Samwell Tarley, son of Randall. And speaking of Randall, we can conclude our brief look at the history of House Tarley with the past deeds of Sam's father, the current Lord of Horn Hill. Lord Randall is considered by Sir Kevin Lannister to be the finest soldier in the realm, a narrow man but iron-willed and shrewd, and as good a soldier as the Reach could boast. Based on the fact that his first child had yet to be born at the time, he was probably relatively young when he was given command of the vanguard of House Tyrell's loyalist army during Robert's Rebellion. At Ashford, the place where his ancestor Samwile had once competed in a tourney with the likes of Prince Arion Targaryen and Sir Duncan the Tall, Lord Randall dealt Robert Baratheon his first defeat, killing Lord Caferin of Thornton in the process. Strictly in terms of their sigils, the visual of the striding huntsman Tarly killing the white fawns of Caferin is highly evocative. But, as it happened, most of the credit for that victory went to Mace Tyrell, the ostensible commander of the army and Tarly's liege lord. While this may have rankled, it most likely rankled even more that, in spite of the victory, Robert Baratheon was the eventual victor of that war. And when Robert died 15 years after taking the throne, Lord Randall would support not Robert's legal heir, Joffrey Baratheon, but Robert's brother, Renly, who had taken the daughter of Mace Tyrell to wife. By this time, Randall Tarly's wife, Melissa, had given him five children, Samwell, the eldest, was followed by three sisters and finally a second son, Dickon. The family dynamics will come under strong focus very shortly. What we want to highlight here is the weight of family tradition and expectations that would affect Samwell from an early age. Not only is his house an old one, steeped in honour and martial tradition, he was given a name that called to mind some of the most noteworthy historical members of that house, and likely a huge burden of expectations of living up to those esteemed ancestors. 
Randall Tarley would go on to be a key figure in the Army of the Reach that Mace would bring to the Lannister side in the War of the Five Kings following Renly's death, leading the center army at the Battle of Blackwater, earning a figurative pat on the shoulder from his liege and his king. The confiscated seat of his wife's family, Brightwater Keep, was given to Mace Tyrell's second son, Garland, yet another situation that may have rankled with the prickly lord of Horn Hill. Lord Randall was in Maidenpool, where he encountered Brienne of Tarth, known to him from Renly's Rainbow Guard, when Marjorie Tyrell was arrested by the Faith. He marched his army back to King's Landing and obtained Marjorie's release with a promise that she would be returned for trial. In an effort to shore up the shaky Lannister-Tyrell alliance, the new regent, Sir Kevin Lannister, named Lord Randall to Tommen's small council as Master of Laws, a position once held by Renly Baratheon, Randall's one-time preference for successor to Tommen's father, as well as by Kevin himself. We'll learn much more about the character of Randall Tarley when we analyse Sam's young life in the upcoming segment. But based on what we've said so far, the fact that Lord Randall was a stern, martial man, and a strict disciplinarian should come as no surprise, nor should his insistence that his son, as a scion of House Tarly, live up to certain requirements as he perceives them. The history that has unfolded around this ancient house has continually reinforced for readers of the main series that the weight of dynastic expectations is a heavy one for Samwell. And exactly how heavy that burden has been is what we'll be discussing next. When I was little, my father used to insist that I attend him in the audience chamber wherever he held court. When he rode to Highgarden to bend his knee to Lord Tyrell, he made me come. Later, though, he started to take Dick on and leave me at home and he no longer cared whether I sat through his audiences, so long as Dickon was there. He wanted his heir at his side. Thus far, we've reflected on the famed historic figures of House Tarly to underscore the weight of expectation placed on Samwell as a scion of a proud family and the son of the highly reputed military commander and hard man Randall Tarly, Before we begin to consider the current events of A Song of Ice and Fire, for a better understanding of Sam, we're going to focus on the accounts of his youth, which are drip-fed to the reader throughout the saga to give us a taste of the difficult upbringing Sam was forced to endure. And a quick note on chronology, some aspects of Sam's youth are difficult to date, and although we have the broad details of what transpired, arranging them exactly chronologically is impossible due to a vagueness George seems to purposefully impart into the text. We believe the author presents Sam's past as a blur so as not to get tangled up in precise details, and as such, we will order events to tell a logical story. In A Game of Thrones, Jon Snow first seeks to protect and then engage with a boy who is immediately portrayed as a frightened misfit as he arrives at Castle Black. Sam eventually feels comfortable enough to recount his backstory to Jon, and when we piece together other pertinent snippets of information, we begin to form a comprehensive picture of Sam's past, which enhances our understanding of the character. First of all, George conveys to us that the Tarleys were a family old in honor, bannerman to Mace Tyrell, Lord of Highgarden and Warden of the South. The eldest son of Lord Randall Tarley, Samwell was born heir to rich lands, a strong keep, and a storied two-handed greatsword named Heartsbane, forged of Valyrian steel and passed down from father to son near 500 years. However, as Sam's childhood progressed, it was clear that the boy had neither interest nor aptitude in martial pursuits, much to the disappointment of his expectant father. By nature, Sam grew up, quote, plump, soft and awkward, and instead of combat, took interest in more delicate pastimes. 
It says, Sam loved to listen to music and make his own songs, to wear soft velvets, to play in the castle kitchen beside the cooks, drinking in the rich smells as he snitched lemon cakes and blueberry tarts. His passions were books and kittens and dancing, clumsy as he was. As it became clear that Sam's hobbies were those his father no doubt deemed soft or feminine, he also began to display a natural aversion to any type of gore. Remembering that the Tarly Sigil is a proud, striding huntsman, and that Randall witnessed and participated in bloody battles during Robert's rebellion, Sam, by comparison, grew ill at the sight of blood and wept to see even a chicken slaughtered. Perhaps if Sam had been born as the second, third or fourth son, Randall's reaction would have been less severe, but in most of Westeros, the right of succession falls to the first male child by the laws of primogeniture which deem that Sam would be in line to one day inherit the entire Tarly estate. Ashamed at the perceived unmanliness of his firstborn son and concerned with reputation and legacy, Randall attempted to correct the core of Sam's personality as he saw it by various cruel means. It says a dozen masters at arms came and went at Horn Hill trying to turn Samwell into the knight his father wanted. The boy was cursed and caned, slapped and starved. One man had him sleep in his chain mail to make him more martial. Another dressed him in his mother's clothing and paraded him through the bailey to shame him into valour. And, predictably enough, Randall's notion of toughening up his son by physical and emotional abuse not only failed, but had the opposite effect intended – Sam recalls that he only grew fatter and more frightened until Lord Randall's disappointment turned to anger and then to loathing. So Randall is actively making matters worse with his brutal, bullheaded, and ignorant treatment of the son he should be displaying affection and kindness towards. But not one to back down, Randall continued his attempt to punish and humiliate Sam into being someone he simply wasn't born to be. In A Feast for Crows, when Sam is aboard the Night's Watch vessel Blackbird sailing from Eastwatch to Bravos, he is afraid to look at the water because it reminds him of the time his Lord Father had tried to teach him how to swim by throwing him into the pond beneath Horn Hill. The water had gotten in his nose and in his mouth and in his lungs, and he coughed and wheezed for hours after Sir Hyle pulled him out. After that, he never dared go in any deeper than his waist. Not only is this further evidence of Randall's abusive parenting strategies, but proves beyond doubt that the practical difficulties Sam now faces in the current timeline are firmly rooted in his prior mistreatment. The fact that Sam merely looking at a body of water triggers an instant and unpleasant flashback reminds us that Randall's conditioning of the boy has caused him to experience painful negative associations with the world around him. And for what it's worth, this story also reveals Heil Hunt as a longtime trusted retainer to House Tarly, making his eventual desertion even more significant. At a certain point, Randall was running out of hope that his son would ever be the manly man expected to carry a Tali bloodline boasting of ancient heroes and modern warriors. In desperation, he invited warlocks from Essos to Horn Hill in order to transform Sam by magical means. At Castle Black, Sam lowers his voice in shame as he confesses to John that... Two men came to the castle, warlocks from Carth, with white skin and blue lips. They slaughtered a bull aurochs and made me bathe in the hot blood, but it didn't make me brave as they'd promised. I got sick and wretched. Father had them scourged. As we highlighted earlier, Sam was naturally afraid of the sight of blood, and so Randall is forcing his son to literally immerse himself in his fear. Not only is the process disgusting, but it's illogical in the notion that superstition could sculpt Sam's soul into Randall's version of perfect masculinity is absurd. 
It's worth noted that bringing sorcerers over from Karth was no doubt very difficult to organize and costly to boot. After all of these desperate attempts to harden Sam, perhaps the final straw for his father came when he sought to make a match for the boy. Randall personally escorted him to the arbor with the secret hope of betrothing him to Paxter Redwine's daughter, Desmera, who comes with a nice dowry according to Davin Lannister in A Feast for Crows. From Randall's perspective, a marriage between Sam and Desmera would have strengthened bonds between House Tarly and the upper echelons of the Reach nobility. Desmara's mother is Mace Tyrell's sister, and the Redwines themselves are a proud and ancient house who boast one of the largest fleets in the Seven Kingdoms. It's no wonder that Stafford Lannister later seeks to wed Davin to Desmera. She is one of the most eligible daughters in Westeros. However, Randall's dream matchup falls apart before it can even begin to take shape. Sam was 10 years old at this point, and we would speculate that most of, or all of, the abuse we've catalogued so far had already been inflicted on him. By this point, Sam's timid personality had been shamed and hurt so deeply that he was at best highly anxious at the prospect of meeting new people under the watch of his father, and at worst, terrified. Paxter Redwine's twin sons, Haber and Horace, took an immediate dislike to him and proceeded to openly mock and humiliate him in much the same way he is at Castle Black by unpleasant characters like Rast. Horace made him squeal like a pig in the training yard, and Haber gave his armor to a kitchen girl who then defeated Sam in combat to the amusement of the squires, pages, and stable boys in the audience. When Randall suggested that his son merely needs a bit of seasoning, Paxter Redwine's prancing fool interjected, Aye, and a pinch of pepper, a few nice cloves, and an apple in his mouth. Sam was being likened to a pig, House Tarly was being openly ridiculed, and we can only imagine how much these dynamics enraged a man like Randall Tarly. With no chance of a match with House Redwine, Randall returned with Sam to Horn Hill. Upon his arrival, Sam learned from his mother, Melissa Florent, that he was not expected to return, and that Randall had intended to leave him behind to squire for Paxter. If Sam had impressed him, he would have been betrothed his daughter and the two houses would have been bound together in their matrimony. We've discussed the caning, slaps, and starvation Sam endured during his early childhood, which no doubt hurt him in more ways than one. Yet there was also this continuous message being conveyed to Sam that he simply wasn't good enough in any regard. One of the only people noted to show Sam any sympathy whatsoever was his mother, who fortunately does not seem to share the merciless worldview of her husband. We're told that, following the disastrous trip to the arbor, Melissa softly washed the tears off his face with a bit of lace. My poor Sam, she murmured. My poor, poor Sam. Knowing that Sam's mother cared for him gives us some relief, although there is also a sense of anguish that she was powerless to counter Randall's dominance within the household and was therefore forced to witness the son she loved be routinely demoralised before her. Had his father been as compassionate as his mother, his childhood could have been wonderful. With Randall's patience worn thin and his disappointment now turned to loathing, there was a huge shift in dynamics when Sam gained a brother. Following Sam, Melissa had birthed three girls in consecutive years, which no doubt added to Randall's anxiety that he'd be left without a son that he deemed appropriate to his reputation. However, the fifth Tarly child was a boy named Dickon. He was likely born in the years before Sam's ill-fated trip to the arbor, so Randall would have returned deeply embarrassed and then pinned his hopes of a strong son on the infant child. And sure enough, as Dickon grew up, he began to display the qualities Randall had hoped for in his firstborn. It says, 
Lord Randall ignored Sam, devoting all his time to the younger boy, a fierce, robust child, more to his liking. Consequently, the onus was taken off Sam, and for a time he was able to avoid Randall's scrutiny in a period of respite which he reflects on as several years of sweet peace with his music and his books. However, the peace could not last long with Randall as the head of the family. With the issue of succession, Randall wanted to ensure that his heir was the martial son he hoped would reflect his own values and sense of masculinity. Before long, Sam became an obstacle to Randall's ambition to, as he saw it, protect the reputation of House Tarley in this cutthroat world of feudal nobility. But as usual, Randall's methods to resolve the issue were narrow-minded and brutal, exacerbated by the fact that Sam had already provided his father with an amicable solution to the problem of succession. Despite Randall's assertions, Sam was far from useless. He might have been shy and awkward, with no physical prowess, but he did have an aptitude in other areas. With his thirst for knowledge and bookishness, he was the Westerosi equivalent of a budding intellectual. Indeed, George has described Sam as one of the most intelligent characters in the saga. And so when Sam expressed interest in travelling to the citadel in Old Town to study for a maester's chain, Randall should have realised that this was an elegant solution to his dilemma. Sam could have forged his chain and fulfilled his potential, and in doing so, willingly renounced his claim to the Tali estate. And really, if Randall was a man of any substance, he should have been proud of the path his son wanted to forge. Instead, Sam's ambitions were snuffed out with more trademark Tarly cruelty. In Sam One of a Feast for Crows, Sam flinched when John introduced the idea that he should travel to Old Town and study for his maester's chain under the Night's Watch banner to succeed Aemon Targaryen as the maester at Castle Black. In that moment, Sam's mind flashed back to an old trauma. No, father, please, I won't speak of it again. I swear it by the seven. Let me out. Please, let me out. And his father's voice continues to boom through his head. They make you wear a chain about your neck. If it is chains you want, come with me. And Sam recalls the moment Randall imprisoned him to ward him off the idea of becoming a maester. For three days and three nights, Sam had sobbed himself to sleep, manacled hand and foot to a wall. The chain around his throat was so tight it broke the skin, and whenever he rolled the wrong way in his sleep, it would cut off his breath. So had Randall supported his son just for once, everybody could have had what they wanted. His decision to hurt Sam instead was based on nothing but misplaced pride. It says, He did not want a son of his cutting up cadavers at the Citadel. Maesters are essential, respected members of noble households from Sunspear to Winterfell. They provide an invaluable service, and the fact that Aemon Targaryen became a maester, Leo Tyrell studies at the Citadel, and Oberyn Martell earned links tells you that there should be no shame in such a career. Yet Randall remained insistent that, quote, no son of House Tarly will ever wear a chain. The men of Horn Hill do not bow and scrape to petty lords. Rather than allowing Sam to follow his dreams, Randall found another, more inhumane way of disinheriting his firstborn son. On his 15th name day, Sam woke up to an unpleasant surprise. He had been awakened to find his horse saddled and ready. Three men-at-arms had escorted him into a wood near Horn Hill, where his father was skinning a deer. You are almost a man grown now, and my heir, Lord Randall Tully had told his eldest son, his long knife laying bare the carcass as he spoke. You have given me no cause to disown you, but neither will I allow you to inherit the land and title that should be Dickon's. Heartsbane must go to a man strong enough to wield her, and you are not worthy to touch her hilt. So I have decided that you shall this day announce that you wish to take the black. 
you will forsake all claim to your brother's inheritance and start north before even fall. And if Sam had refused to take the black, Randall threatened that, quote, On the morrow we shall have a hunt, and somewhere in these woods your horse will stumble, and you will be thrown from the saddle to die. Or so I will tell your mother. Given Randall's prior cruelty and all else we know about him, we have little doubt that he would have been true to his word. To conclude his callous, heartless treatment of Sam, he told the boy as he was skinning the deer that nothing would please me more than to hunt you down like the pig you are. His arms were red to the elbow as he laid the skinning knife aside. So, there is your choice, the night's watch. He reached inside the deer, ripped out its heart, and held it in his fist red and dripping. Or this. While the Night's Watch was historically a place of honour, in recent generations the organisation has become known for recruiting increasing numbers of criminals and deviants, societal outcasts who would never be missed in their places of origin. The reader witnessed Night's Watch recruiter Joran attempting to escort Rorge and Baita to the wall in a cage after clearing out the dungeons of King's Landing. In terms of Randall's honour, is the notion of Sam serving at the Citadel really so much worse than sending him to Castle Black? The answer to that may lie in the detail that when Sam arrives in Old Town in A Feast for Crows, Leo Tyrell will indicate that Randall had told people Sam was dead. Though Randall no doubt expected that Sam would indeed perish on the wall, it seems like even that admission must have been too much for his pride, and we wonder if the wall was simply conveniently distant and out of sight, perhaps allowing him to come up with a story blaming Sam's death on that hunting accident he had threatened him with. All in all, one has to consider who is really the weak party in this equation. Sam might not have fit his father's expectations, but instead of adjusting those expectations, Randall kept himself willfully blind to Sam's natural talents. Perhaps this is the weakness to be found in Randall's character. After all, are you really a tough man if you abuse your child because you fear for your reputation? Yeah, Randall might be a hardened military man, but he evidently lacks the strength to look inside himself and consider his own shortcomings. Instead of realizing his torture of Sam was adversely affecting the boy, he blamed Melissa for softening up his son. When Sam sings for Gilly's Babe in A Storm of Swords, it says, he remembered the last time he'd sung the song with his mother to lull baby Dick into sleep. His father had heard their voices and come barging in, angry. I will have no more of that, Lord Randall told his wife harshly. You ruined one boy with those soft septon songs. Do you mean to do the same to this babe? Then he looked at Sam and said, Go sing to your sisters if you must sing. I don't want you near my son. We can only imagine Melissa's torment when Randall blames her for Sam's perceived flaws after witnessing the abuse of her beloved son. Randall's household is tarnished by his violence. His behaviour stems from his ego and inflated sense of pride, but he lacks the courage to accept his firstborn son for who he is. Ignorance is weakness, impatience is weakness, cruelty is weakness, and hurting others to validate one's own masculinity is not a sign of strength. Altogether, Randall Tarley is a deeply flawed man who does not allow Sam to be himself, and the boy grows toward manhood as not only the victim of a toxic household, but without the upbringing necessary to arm him with self-assurance and confidence. As such, Randall has placed an emotional curse upon his son, and Sam's great internal challenge is to come to terms with and learn to overcome the damage he sustained throughout his childhood. And if you're listening to this catalogue of mistreatment, and it's reminding you in any way of your own family history, you should know that you're not alone. 
While none of us are likely to have been bathed in bull's blood or chained to a wall, the dynamic of an overbearing parent displaying hate instead of love and creating fear instead of assurance is commonplace in many households. And so many of us might relate to the feeling that we can't be ourselves, that people don't understand us, and that we are in some way not living up to the world's impossible expectations of us. Many avid readers and all-around nerds are shy, awkward creatures, and we're all too often raised to believe that these traits are a weakness, when in fact they're often a sign of intelligence, empathy, and psychological diversity. It can be extremely painful to have these insecurities exacerbated by your own loved ones. George R.R. R. Martin's father was a longshoreman, a hard job for hard people, and the author has said that, quote, "...my father was a distant figure." I don't think that he ever understood me, and I don't know that I ever understood him. And although there is no insinuation of Randall-esque abuse, we can infer that, being one of the biggest nerds to ever walk the earth, George had a tough relationship with his father, and that the shadow of those dynamics have followed him throughout his life and career. Samwell is the closest character we have to a George R. R. Martin self-insert in A Song of Ice and Fire, with the author repeatedly confessing to interviewers that Sam is the one he resembles the most. One has to wonder if just a little bit of Sam's pain is George's. But if recounting Sam's backstory has been difficult, have no fear. Next, we're going to discuss how Sam's internal anguish manifests and ultimately how all of this could be groundwork for a cathartic and uplifting character arc that comes straight from the author's heart. If you think Randall crushed his son's spirit forever, think again. However, for young Samuel Tarley, it might have felt that way when he first arrived at the training yard of Castle Black. Seven gods, would you look at this, John? John turned. Through the slit of his helm, he beheld the fattest boy he had ever seen standing in the door of the armory. By the look of him, he must have weighed twenty stone. The fur collar of his embroidered surcoat was lost beneath his chins. Pale eyes moved nervously in a great round moon of a face, and plump sweaty fingers wiped themselves on the velvet of his doublet. Th they told me I was to come here for, for, for training, he said to no one in particular. The quote we just heard was the moment Samuel Tarley entered the story. Immediately we get the sense that he's going to find life extremely difficult at the wall. Given we're examining Sam's story chronologically, we know that Sam was a large child, and Jon Snow immediately observes the boy's weight before noticing the nervousness in his eyes. Being overweight is hardly a crime, but in Sam's story we get to witness the telling reactions of other people to his size and examine how he internalizes that stigma. Both Sam's weight and anxiety were at the least exacerbated by his father's abuse as it was noted that the stress steered him into a habit of comfort eating when he became terrified of Randall. The biggest lie told about trauma in the real world is that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. This old adage is meant to inspire hope, yet carries the same ignorant message Randall imposes on Sam. The truth is that extreme trauma can damage your emotional landscape and create all manner of psychological disorders, which is exactly what's happening with Sam. Victims deserve pity, kindness and understanding, not stigma, ignorance and further hurt. But the wall is not known for being a place of empathy. Sir Alistair Thorne, another hard, martial figure who no doubt reminded Sam of his father, takes an immediate dislike to the boy. The master-at-arms is the first one at the wall to liken him to a pig, saying, Now they send us pigs to man the wall. Is fur and velvet your notion of armor, my lord of ham? Soon the cruel metaphor catches on, and before the end of the chapter, Sam has been called a pig by various characters in patterns of behaviour not unlike old-fashioned schoolyard bullying. 
Thorne is using the same method of hardening up any soft hearts at the wall that Randall did as a father, which serves to make Sam's introduction to the Night's Watch all the more difficult. Given that Paxter Redwine's fool had suggested Sam be covered in seasoning with an apple in his mouth, and that Randall called Sam a pig when threatening to hunt him down, the boy must have thought he was living his nightmares over again. Knowing that Sam had so recently been chased away from his home by his heartless father, we can only imagine what it was like to arrive at a place so foreign to him, being forced to step into the unknown, into a training yard where he would suffer further pain and humiliation. While George's use of simile in describing Sam, like an overcooked sausage about to burst its skin, injects the scene with absurd humor, It also nods to the cruel pig references, while the boy's mismatched armor, cobbled together by Donald Noy in order to accommodate his unusually wide frame, symbolizes just how much of a misfit Sam appears to be at Castle Black from the outset. In spite of his obvious ineptitude with a sword, Tali is forced to fight the apprentice stonemason Holder. Predictably, Sam is beaten within a minute. It says... The fat boy was on the ground, his whole body shaking as blood leaked through his shattered helm and between his pudgy fingers. I yield, he shrilled. No more, I yield, don't hit me. Rast and some of the other boys were laughing. However, Thorn is not satisfied and he orders Halder to continue punishing Sam, even chastising him for not hitting the cowering boy hard enough. Throughout the bruising encounter, the Honourable Jon Snow is wincing, almost as if he can feel Sam's pain. When Rast encourages Halder to cut us off some ham, Sam's discomfort is too much for Jon to bear, and he interjects with a cry of, Enough! Witnessing the scene from Jon's point of view at once makes us like Jon more, and gives us further sympathy towards Sam, John's pity becomes ours as Thorn and Rast become the antagonists in the scene. Whether Thorn, an anointed knight, is secretly impressed by John's chivalrous streak is a point open for debate, but he reacts to the defiance by sending three recruits, Rast, Albert and Halder, against Snow, who is now Sam's last line of defence. Perceiving the unfair odds, Pip and Gren step to John's side and the fight begins. Collecting these boys together in opposition to Thorne's cutthroat authority provides the groundwork for the friendship they will go on to share throughout the story. Sam has quickly gone from a position of hopelessness to being supported by kind strangers, which is a positive shift in dynamics for him, and one that he was surely not expecting. After all that Sam had undergone through his childhood, there's hope that he might survive at the wall. When Thorne walks away from the scene in disgust at John and his friend's victory, the training session comes to an end. Sam nervously introduces himself to John and soon confesses his cowardice, leading John to ponder what sort of man would proclaim himself a coward. Within a few short pages, Sam's internal and external character objectives have been strongly established. Internally, he must face fear and overcome the cowardice, which saw him cling to the floor as he was being beaten. And at this stage, his external objective is simply to survive an environment he's apparently ill-suited to after the damaging conditioning inflicted by his father. Both of these goals seem daunting to Sam, who first apologizes for being himself, saying... I don't mean to to be like I am, and then confesses that he can never do better. The path ahead of him is long and steep, and he's out of shape in more ways than one, but sometimes when a character is introduced on such a low note, the only way to go is up. Fortunately for Sam, John's sympathy does not end at the training yard. When Sam sits alone at dinner, John joins him and before long tries to understand the boy, asking, Why are you always so frightened? The pair go outside and Sam begins to cry, huge choking sobs that made his whole body shake. 
until Ghost lopes over to lick away the tears and turn the sobs to laughter. It says a lot about both characters that they immediately begin to confide in each other when alone. We've mentioned the decline in voluntary recruits at the Wall, and it's probably no accident that John and Sam, the only two castle-raised boys in the current group, would find each other. The friendship can't all be one-way traffic, though, with John continually protecting Sam, and so George has Tali listen intently to Snow's description of his haunted dreams of the Winterfell crypts. By now, Sam is comfortable enough to share something of his own as he recounts his backstory at Horn Hill, which we analyzed in the previous segment, giving the reader a sudden understanding of Sam's character as a victim of abuse. It's established that Randall Tarley is a proud military man from a storied family and that the house sigil is a striding huntsman. So when John asks Sam if he likes hunting, and the boy shudders, replying that he hates it, There are, along with all else that has transpired within this chapter, signposts to what character archetype the author will be seeking to employ here. While comparisons are frequently made within the fandom, drawing parallels between Samwell and his almost namesake Samwise Ganji from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings trilogy, which we'll be assessing later in the episode, we see room for significant comparisons to be made with another famous character from fantasy pop culture. In L. Frank Baum's The Wizard of Oz, the cowardly lion is a central character who aids Dorothy on her quest to follow the yellow brick road in order to find the wizard and return home. Given that lions are the kings of the jungle, they are expected to be strong, fierce and above all else brave. However, the cowardly lion struggles to live up to these expectations. He's naturally shy and timid, and is thus haunted by feelings of self-loathing and inadequacy. George uses this archetype to outline Sam. Just like the cowardly lion, he is expected to be a certain way because he's a tarly, boasting a proud lineage of hard men and warriors. Their sigil is a huntsman, but Sam hates the sight of blood. Both the lion and Sam are ostensibly misfits, uncomfortable in their own skins, and with the belief that they are craven, each of their stories revolve around finding courage and overcoming fear. Such are the similarities between the pair that we could call Samwell the Cowardly Huntsman. But Sam and the lion have one other thing in common that comes to the fore in this chapter. Both are supported by a good bunch of friends who accept them for who they are. While the lion has Dorothy, the Scarecrow and the Tin Man, Sam has John, Pip and Gren. Misfits have a funny way of finding family in each other. It's true in real life as it is in Oz and at the Wall. The chapter, which began so painfully for Sam, ends with hope. John, Pip and Gren visit Rast in the night and use Ghost to frighten him into agreeing not to hurt Sam anymore. The sad, lost and lonely figure who came to Castle Black expecting to be bullied and ostracised has found a replacement family within this harsh institution. When Sam confesses to John that he's never had a friend before, Snow replies, we're not friends, we're brothers. And John goes on to think, Castle Black was his life now, and his brothers were Sam and Gren and Halder and Pip, and the other castouts who wore the black of the Night's Watch. Although the introduction to Sam ends on this heartwarming note, Sam still has a lot of work to do. He must now use this friendship and brotherhood as the foundation of a positive arc of growth, improvement, and self-acceptance. He must show that in spite of his obvious shortcomings, he can move away from a position of pity and instead display his hidden strengths, offering something back not only to his group of friends, but to the ancient order of the Night's Watch itself. John Snow and friends try their hardest to continue to protect Sam at Castle Black until they hear that he won't be graduating into the Brotherhood with them. 
Instead, Sam will face the training yard and Sir Alistair alone, which causes a deep restlessness in John. But not everyone at the wall is suited to fighting, and John realises that the Night's Watch is in fact a diverse team, some with specialised skills. In a last-ditch effort to look after his friend, John approaches Maester Eamon in his wooden keep below the rookery. Eamon's steward, Chet, refuses John entry, to which John stubbornly declares that he will stand here all night if I must. Chet is immediately characterized as angry and impatient, altogether ill-suited to be Eamon's assistant. The maester emerges and hears John's plea to allow Sam to graduate, and although Chet does his best to undermine the effort by again likening Sam to a pig, Eamon allows John to continue. Snow uses an extended metaphor to compare the Night's Watch to a maester's chain, which joins all different types of metal together. He concludes that the Night's Watch needs all sorts too. Why else have rangers and stewards and builders Lord Randall couldn't make Sam a warrior, and Sir Alistair won't either. You can't hammer tin into iron no matter how hard you beat it. But does that mean tin is useless? Why shouldn't Sam be a steward? He then continues, He could help you. He could do sums, and he knows how to read and write. I know Chet can't read, and Clytus has weak eyes. Sam read every book in his father's library. He'd be good with the ravens, too. Animals seem to like him. Ghost took to him straight off. There's a lot he could do besides fighting. The Night's Watch needs every man. Why kill one to no end? Make use of him instead. Jon Snow proves to Aemon that Sam is far from useless and the maester is impressed enough to accept Sam for graduation, taking him on as a personal steward to replace the seething Chet. Once again, Sam is fortunate to have such a loyal friend, and John truly reveals himself to be a deft thinker and great leader in front of a highly respected member of the Watch. But, as we said, friendship can't all go one way, and so Sam must seek to address the balance and return the kindness and concern shown to him when he can. After both boys take their vows and become joined to the Night's Watch for life, John has a moment of weakness. Learning that his half-brother Rob is marching south with a northern host, he aims to abscond. Sam catches John as he's preparing his horse and does his best to discourage him from fleeing, telling him, John, you can't. I won't let you. When John threatens to ride his friend down, Sam stands his ground. Don't forget that Sam has characterised himself as craven, but much like the cowardly lion, he finds bravery when it is needed most, and so waits until the very last moment to jump out the way of the horse. After falling to the ground, Sam picks himself up and encourages Pip, Gren and other friends to help find John. Again, this is a brave decision from Sam. Rather than informing Lord Commander Mormont, he risks offending his own vows in order to save John from himself. Fortunately, Sam's plan works, the group finds Snow and returns to Castle Black with him. In Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Albus Dumbledore declared, It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. Here, Sam embodies that sentiment, proving that not only can he be brave, but that he can be a great friend, too, reciprocating the faith John had shown in him, while perhaps saving him from the swift Night's Watch justice we witnessed in the very first chapter of the novel. By the end of A Game of Thrones, and in spite of a lack of Sam POV, the reader has a clear grasp of his character, and there's the overall sense that things are beginning to improve for him as the story progresses. And when we first see Sam in Clash, he is in his element, hunched over dusty old books and faded maps in the Castle Black Library. However, George famously doesn't like to make things too easy for his characters, and as such, Sam is soon expected to leave the quiet, comfortable confines of the library behind and join the army of men in black marching north beyond the wall on the Great Ranging. As Lord Mormont's aide, he's expected to tend to the ravens and send messages. 
Given that Sam is physically unfit and emotionally timid, it must have seemed like a thoroughly daunting task, facing the danger of the wildlings and whatever dark forces killed Othor and then reanimated his corpse within a freezing, unforgiving landscape. Indeed, John 3 begins with the point of view wondering how Sam is faring, given that he was not a good rider, even in fair weather, and six days of rain had made the ground treacherous. Fortunately, respite is on the way as the procession reaches Craster's Keep, hoping for food, shelter, and information before they push further north into even more inhospitable terrain. At this point, Sam is noted to be slumped and wet, and despite all of the fear he must be struggling with, he assures John that nothing has killed him yet. At this stage, we can guess that Sam's resilience will be severely tested during this ranging expedition. And as a curious and perceptive thinker, Sam is immediately suspicious of Craster, saying he marries his daughters and obeys no laws but those he makes himself. Nonetheless, the men of the Watch are repeatedly told to respect Craster, and especially to keep away from his daughter wives. However, Sam is empathetic to the bone, and when one of the girls, Gilly, befriends him, he cannot help but try and help protect her and her unborn child, who might be offered as a sacrifice to the cold gods if born male. Although their situations differ in many respects, Sam can relate to having a cruel father, and so he makes an effort to protect Gilly with John's help. Unfortunately, there's little John can do, but like the rest of Sam's story in Clash, George is setting things up for the return journey in A Storm of Swords. And it's within the pages of Storm that Sam really comes into his own as a character. George not only includes him in Chet's apocalyptic prologue, but also adds him to the roster of POVs, giving us close access to his thoughts and inner world. With Jon Snow now on a solo mission to directly infiltrate Mance Raider's wildling camp, it's time for Sam to step away from his early role as protagonist sidekick and come to the fore himself. The A Storm of Swords prologue begins with Chet reminiscing about his cushy job that he held at Castle Black until Jon Snow's intervention. He thinks, I should be safe back at the wall, tending the bloody ravens and making fires for old Maester Aemon. It was the bastard Jon Snow who had taken that from him, him and his fat friend Sam Tarly. By now the reader could be forgiven for forgetting about Chet, but what's great about minor characters in A Song of Ice and Fire is that George doesn't forget. True to his perpetually disgruntled characterization, Chet still harbours ill feelings for his change of roles within the Night's Watch towards John and Sam, the two castle raised recruits who inspire so much jealousy in him, all of which is greatly exacerbated by the fact he's, quote, freezing his bloody balls off with a pack of hounds deep in the haunted forest. And in his frustrated and uncomfortable state, we learn that Chet has hatched a cunning plan to betray the Night's Watch with a band of accomplices by killing Lord Commander Mormont and several officers before deserting without a trace. We've covered this chapter in a dedicated episode previously, so here we'll keep a tight focus on Sam. We learn that Sam is one of Chet's targets in a plan that is at once vindictive and practical, given Sam is in charge of the Ravens, which allow a line of communication to Castle Black. Despite not being a soldier, Sam finds himself with an essential role on the Fist of the First Men, and tension mounts throughout the chapter as the reader wonders if Chet will really whisper give my love to Lord Snow in Sam's ear before slicing his throat open as planned. Chet's mutinous ambitions are eventually scuppered by fresh snowfall, which he knows will make the assailants easy to chase down, given they'll be leaving trackable footprints. He cancels his plan to strike that evening, but still aims to murder Sam out of pure spite and predicts that Tarly will wet himself. Just as tension reaches a boiling point when Chet is looking down upon the sleeping Sam, poised with a dagger in hand, comes the ooh 
of the Night's Watch horn. When the second horn blows, denoting wildlings approaching, Chet thinks the fear on Sam's big moon face made him want to laugh. Chet believes himself braver than Sam, yet when the third horn blows, indicating that the others are approaching, it's Chet who first wets himself. Later Sam does too, and so we see that fear is a great equaliser. Yet there's ultimately nothing equal about the reactions of Sam and Chet to the supernatural danger, given the former deserts his post, while the latter, as we learn in the first Sam chapter, commits to doing his duty through the carnival of horrors the others bring to the fist. Sam 1 of A Storm of Swords is a superb chapter wherein the battle at the fist is recalled in Sam's memory as he attempts to retreat from the scene. He's sobbing while trudging through the snow after witnessing unimaginable undead horror being inflicted upon his brothers. The very first thought we witness is, this is the last step, the very last. I can't go on. I can't. In great physical and emotional pain, and as someone who already likely suffered a form of PTSD due to his upbringing, Sam is close to giving up on life and allowing himself to die. Yet he doesn't. He keeps taking small steps forward, his feet frozen and his mind disassociating from reality at every turn. But crucially, he's surviving. With Sam's unfitness already well established, he must now wade through knee-deep snowfall, exhausted, terrified and in pain. He thinks, I have to stop, it hurts too much, I'm so cold and tired, I need to sleep, just a little sleep beside a fire, and a bite to eat that isn't frozen. But Sam also knows that stopping means a sure death, given that the others and their army of undead, now bolstered by the slain brothers of the Night's Watch, are still at their heels. They are behind us, they are still behind us, they are taking us one by one, he thinks. Having not slept for so long, Sam had forgotten which day it was. All he can do is cry, and George repeats the phrase, sobbing he took another step, no less than six times to begin paragraphs in the early part of the chapter. Sam keeps crying, but somehow he keeps walking, even if it is one step at a time. Perhaps the most well-known commentary on bravery in A Song of Ice and Fire is Ned Stark's early advice to Bran that only when a man is afraid can he be brave. Sam is the embodiment of that philosophy following the events on the fist. When he begs the world for mercy, his thoughts race back to Maslin screaming for mercy, an intrusive memory indicative of the associative thinking trauma can bring. Maslin was brutally slain by the undead, who Sam notes as being devoid of any mercy whatsoever, followed by, I mustn't think of that, don't think, don't remember, just walk, just walk, just walk. When Sam trips and falls over a tree root hidden under the thick snow, he is ready to die. This is the end, he thinks, and he struggles to muster the strength required to stand up in his layers of heavy clothing and mail. He wants the snow to cover him and warm him like a blanket, a final retreat into nature's womb. But as his mind plays tricks, he recalls that in the midst of the terror at the fist, he did his duty. They'll have to say, I died a man of the Night's Watch. I did. I did. I did my duty. No one can say I forswore myself. I'm fat and I'm weak and I'm craven, but I did my duty. Sam recalls Lord Mormont's instructions to send ravens to Castle Black and the Shadow Tower should the Night's Watch be attacked. We learn he had shown initiative in writing messages out ahead of time and that he'd never seen so much fear in a face than when Chet heard the third horn and subsequently refused to help with the ravens. Blissfully unaware that the dagger in Chet's hand was meant for him, Sam went to the birds, who were shrieking furiously in panic, pecking him hard enough to draw blood. With chaos all around and his mind full of fear, Sam found the composure and presence of mind to do his duty. It says he made himself do it anyway and sent off the ravens. 
By Ned Stark's definition, Sam was truly brave, and he sent invaluable intel back to the Night's Watch headquarters. Yet still, Sam thinks of himself as, quote, only fat and weak, the greatest craven in the Seven Kingdoms. Now the reader is privy to Sam's thoughts, we see the depth with which Randall's bullying of his son has manifested in Sam's self-concept. He defines himself by his weight and his cowardice, internalizing the abuse of his childhood. It says, He was such a coward. Lord Randall, his father, had always said so, and he had been right. Sam was his heir, but he had never been worthy, so his father had sent him away to the wall. A coward's not worth weeping over. He had heard his father tell his mother as much half a hundred times. And as he contemplates his past, Sam's memories continue to flash back to the horror of the fist, with the jumps in the timeline creating a disorientating effect for the reader, which conveys Sam's confusion. He wishes the memories of the fist away, instead focusing on his sister and even Gilly. But the truth is that Sam struggles to dissociate into a world of pleasant childhood memories because he simply doesn't have many to draw from. His mind is imbued with one trauma or another. As he struggles to chase away thoughts of zombie wildlings killing his fellows or a horrifying undead bear mauling the spear lines, a voice tells him to get up. Gren looms over him and pleads with him to save himself, but Sam ends up curled up in the fetal position. Gren demonstrates tough love by kicking him into action, and when that fails, the ironically named Small Paul, who, unbeknownst to Sam, was one of the would-be mutineers, lifts Sam up into his arms to carry him forth. Sam protests that he's not a baby and that he just wants to die, but Gren will have none of it. Paul might be helping because... Being like Lenny Small from John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men, he has a fondness for animals and wants Sam to give him a pet raven, but Gren is a genuine friend. When Sam thinks that the only reason Gren and others like him is because of Jon Snow's influence is his self-loathing talking, he ignores the possibility that Gren actually might like him and that he is worthy of concern. And so, with a little help from his friends, Sam overcomes his resignation and apathy and allows himself to be saved. He thinks more on the brutal events of the Fist and contemplates his failure to send back a final message to Castle Black. Before they know it, Sam, Gren, and Paul find themselves alone and without basic necessities when a bitter cold blows through the trees. From behind the branches of a great green sentinel, A dead horse emerges with a rider pale as ice. It says, The other slid gracefully from the saddle to stand upon the snow. Sword slim it was, and milky white. Its armor rippled and shifted as it moved, and its feet did not break the crust of the new-fallen snow. Simple-minded Paul is upset that the other has hurt a horse and unslings the long-hafted axe strapped across his back. Gren steps forth, believing he can kill the being with fire, given the whites on the fist were vulnerable to fire arrows. However, the others are a different sort of creature. The other's sword gleamed with a faint blue glow. It moved toward Gren, lightning quick, slashing. When the ice blue blade brushed the flames, a screech stabbed Sam's ears, sharp as a needle. The head of the torch tumbled sideways to vanish beneath a deep drift of snow, the fire snuffed out at once. And all Gren held was a short wooden stick. He flung it at the other, cursing, as small Paul charged in with his axe. The fear that filled Sam then was worse than any fear he had ever felt before, and Samwell Tarly knew every kind of fear. Mother, have mercy, he wept forgetting the old gods in his terror. Father, protect me. Oh, his fingers found his dagger and he filled his hand with that. The whites had been slow, clumsy things, but the other was light as snow on the wind. It slid away from Paul's axe, armor rippling, and its crystal sword twisted and spun and slipped between the iron rings of Paul's mail through leather and wool and bone and flesh. It came out his back with a hiss 
and Sam heard Paul say, Oh, as he lost the axe. Impaled, his blood smoking around the sword, the big man tried to reach his killer with his hands and almost had before he fell. The weight of him tore the strange pale sword from the other's grip. Do it now! Stop crying and fight, you baby! Fight, Craven! It was his father he heard. It was Alice at Thorn. It was his brother Dickon and the boy Rast. Craven! 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 He giggled hysterically, wondering if they would make a white of him. A huge, fat, white white, always tripping over its own dead feet. Do it, Sam! Was that John now? John was dead. You can do it! You can! Just do it! And then he was stumbling forward, falling more than running, really, closing his eyes and shoving the dagger blindly out before him with both hands. He heard a crack, like the sound ice makes when it breaks beneath a man's foot, and then a screech so shrill and sharp that he went staggering backward with his hands over his muffled ears and fell hard on his arse. In spite of his size, Paul was no match for the other, who ripped its sword through his ringmail as if it were silk. As Paul dies, impaled upon the icy sword, he grasps for the other, tearing the blade from its grip. This was the opportunity Sam needed, as a fear filled him then, worse than any fear he had ever felt before, and Samuel Tarley knew every kind of fear. But once more, the only time a man can truly be brave is when he's afraid, and Sam filled his hand with the blade in his pocket. He heard the cruel voice of his father and other tormentors, Alistair Thorne and Rast, calling him a craven. But then John's voice cut through, encouraging him to do it. You can do it, just do it. We witness the importance of just one supportive voice in his head as he draws courage from John's words. Unbeknownst to Sam, the dagger he pulled from his pocket was not a steel blade, but Chekhov's dragonglass blade given to him earlier by John. He closes his eyes and sort of blindly pushes forth and falls into the other. And as the enemy then melts harmlessly away... Sam becomes the first known other slayer in 8,000 years. Not only that, but he now knows the key to killing both whites and their other overlords. Invaluable information which may well one day save the world. He has so far survived the battle at the Fist and its horrifying aftermath, witnessed whites burning and an undead bear beheading Thor and Smallwood before leaving an other puddled in the snow. Sam thinks himself a craven, but it's a funny kind of craven who can maneuver through all of this and live to tell the tale. Like the cowardly lion from Oz, Sam has found ways of feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Through his deeds, he becomes an unlikely and reluctant hero who must now make it back to Castle Black to safeguard and pass on his essential knowledge which could greatly aid the defense of humanity. And readers are left to wonder if the attack by the other was somehow related to the old war horn still in Sam's possession. And in Sam's next chapter, he's made it back to the relative warmth and safety of Craster's Keep, where a woman who we can guess is Gilly is giving birth upstairs while men are dying below. Of course, both of these things frighten Sam, who has been ironically dubbed Slayer by brothers mocking his story about killing another. Remembering that some of the men now sheltering at Craster's were involved in Chet's mutinous scheme, to which Sam remains oblivious, and the fact that Craster himself is hardly the most friendly and welcoming of hosts, there's a definite air of danger under the old man's roof from the outset. The exhausted night's watchmen demand more food, but Craster's more concerned with his own self-preservation and thinks the men are lucky to be just sharing his fire. Jor Mormont remains acutely aware of Craster's value to the watch, as well as the protective tradition of guest right, which he hopes his men will adhere to. Yet siding with Craster puts the Lord Commander at odds with some of his own men. 
And so Sam finds himself stuck between wanting to ask for more food for the injured men at least and respecting Craster's hospitality, which highlights the bind the Night's Watch find themselves in by relying on this vile and brutal man. Even after the trauma he's undergone, Sam does not let go of right and wrong, which is testament to the true strength of his character. He thinks that knights are supposed to defend women and children, and in spite of not being a knight, he reflects on the vows he pledged to the Night's Watch. He concludes that he should help Gilly, who is terrified her baby will be born a boy, and that Craster will therefore sacrifice him to his gods. As the chapter progresses, the Black Brothers grow more unruly and contemptuous of Sam. He explains to Gran that the Slayer nickname is just a different way of them calling me a coward, and he refuses to take credit for his exploits because he was so scared at the time. Gran advises, Sometimes I think everyone is just pretending to be brave, and none of us really are. Maybe pretending is how you get brave. I don't know. Let them call you Slayer. Who cares? One person not mocking Sam is Lord Mormont, who, through Sam's accounts, realises that we lost sight of the true enemy before contemplating the nature of Dragonglass. Sam began the ranging, believing himself to be a spare part or liability, yet he's become a central figure in the conversation about how to defeat man's great nemesis. And when Gilly's baby is confirmed to be a son, Sam finds the courage to stand up to Craster, suggesting that the Watch take the baby back to Castle Black. When Craster barks at him, Sam's nervousness is obvious. I I only meant if you didn't want him, his mouth to feed, with winter coming on, we, we could take him and... Yet the point is that Sam continues to do the right thing in spite of his fear and his self-loathing. Before long, the hostile atmosphere inside the keep reaches boiling point and frustrated with Craster's perceived selfishness, Clubfoot Carl calls the old man niggardly, a liar and then finally a bastard. In the ensuing melee, Dirk slits Craster's throat before Olo Lophan silences Lord Mormont's protests by stabbing the old bear in the belly as, in Sam's words, the world went mad. It's worth noting that the initial breakers of guest right, Carl, Dirk and Olo, were all Chet's accomplices, so perhaps we can draw an indirect line from the mutiny at Craster's all the way back to John requesting that Aemon promote Sam in A Game of Thrones. As Jor Mormont lies dying, he beckons Sam over and tells him to run. Sam contemplates where he will go and thinks to himself, I am not afraid. He calls this a queer feeling, and despite being surrounded by chaos and danger, it's the first time we've seen such a thought in his point of view. He goes on to tell Mormont, I'm not afraid anymore of you, or of anything. This is evidence of a positive change in Sam's internal world, as if his fear has reached its saturation point. Whether this new feeling in Sam is born from courage or numbness is open for debate, but he draws upon some sort of inner fortitude when he chooses to take Gilly and the babe with him as he leaves for Castle Black. This decision immediately saves Gilly from the brutality of the mutineers and the baby from the icy touch of the others who are confirmed to be Craster's boys transformed. Once again, Sam is making heroic decisions in the face of great adversity. Now though, he is burdened with great responsibility. For the first time, he needs to protect people other than himself. Through his arc, he's relied on others like John, Gren and Small Paul, but now he has to be a leader for Gilly and the baby to survive. It's a huge test for his character, and George is not yet done setting formidable obstacles in his path. 
When the three of them arrive at what Sam at first thinks might be White Tree, he's lost and desperate, concerned with how much they might have strayed from the correct course. He bonds with Gilly and sings to the baby to keep spirits up, and there's a growing sense of family between the three of them. But these newfound family dynamics trigger painful memories from his past, and he wonders what his father would think of him now. It says, I killed one of the others, my lord, he imagined, saying. I stabbed him with an obsidian dagger, and my sworn brothers call me Sam the Slayer now. But even in his fancies, Lord Randall only scowled, disbelieving. After strange dreams of being at Horn Hill and taking his father's place in the castle, he awakes to witness shadows moving behind the door. Gilly believes whoever's outside has come for the baby, and before long Sam perceives that that whoever is in fact the undead small Paul. Of all the whites Sam could square off against, George chooses the largest and strongest. Initially, Sam thinks of himself as a coward and begs Paul for mercy, but there is little of Paul left, and Sam realises that there is no reasoning with the undead. Gods give me courage, Sam prayed. For once, give me a little courage, just long enough for her to get away. So we see that Sam's sole focus is for Gilly and the baby to escape, and that he's prepared to die and be revived as a thrall if it means that those two are safe. It says there was no time to be afraid as he launches himself forward to stab the white in the back with the dragonglass dagger. However, the brittle blade has no effect on the white, armored as it is in Paul's Night's Watch chainmail. It's interesting that George continues to use Sam of all people to establish the rules of killing others in whites in a show-don't-tell style of exposition. Paul turns to face Sam and wraps his cold fingers around his throat when all Sam wants to do is shout, Run, Gilly, run! In the ensuing struggle, Sam loses his steel knife, leaving him completely unarmed, and such is Paul's strength that he thinks the white will rip his head off. Sam punches and kicks and struggles to no avail, but just when his world is shrinking, he manages to shift his weight and lurch forward as they both crash onto the floor. And as he struggles to grasp his knife, Sam remembers the fire. It says, Only ember and ashes remained, but still... He could not breathe or think. Sam wrenched himself sideways, pulling Paul with him, his arms flailed against the dirt floor, groping, reaching, scattering the ashes, until at last they found something hot, a chunk of charred wood, smouldering red and orange within the black. His fingers closed around it, and he smashed it into Paul's mouth, so hard he felt teeth shatter. Ready to die, Sam thinks regretfully about not living up to the expectations of his father when Paul's head suddenly bursts into flame. As we learned on the fist, fire is the white's Achilles heel, and as flames come out of Paul's mouth, the blue glow recedes from his eyes. Useless Sam Tarley has now killed another and a very formidable white. The latter might be the bigger achievement, given that he was protecting Gilly and that there was no luck involved. He'd previously downplayed his killing of the other by highlighting the good fortune involved there, yet here Sam was in a straight-up fight for his life with a white and defeated him. Even Sam is going to struggle to undermine his own efforts there. As Sam gets his bearings after the great tussle, he realises that the building is surrounded by whites and sees undead versions of Chet, Lark the Sisterman, Softfoot and Riles. These zombies pull apart Sam's garron before his eyes, leaving the three of them trapped in the village. Just as Sam succumbs to self-pity and cries that it's not fair, A raven lands on his shoulder, and he realises that the village's heart tree is covered in ravens. The birds attack the whites in a swarm so thick Sam couldn't see the moon, and a mysterious black brother emerges on a giant elk to whisk the trio away. 
As Sam mounts the elk, he realizes that the rider's hands are cold and dead. Ultimately, the three of them are saved by a supernatural intervention, which we later realize has been orchestrated by the three eyed crow, Brynden Rivers, using his undead servant we come to know as Cold Hands. Despite the manner of the rescue, what's really important to Sam's character is what came before. He legitimately faced terror and fought off the undead to successfully defend Gilly, and so Coldhand's timely appearance feels wholly earned. Coldhand delivers the three of them to the night fort, where Sam guides Bran, Hodor, Mira, and Jojen back to the mysterious Black Brother in order to continue their own journey north. Before departing, Cold Hands makes Sam swear to tell no one about Bran's journey. Let the world believe the boy is dead. We want no seekers coming after us. Swear it, Samwell of the Night's Watch. Swear it for the life you owe me. Sam arrives at Castle Black after the battle against the Wildlings, and with Jor dead, the Watch are seeking to elect a new Lord Commander. The fact that Sam involves himself and plays Cotter Pike and Dennis Malister against each other in order to promote Jon Snow and deny the unsuitable Jano Slint the top rank of the organization proves without doubt that somewhere along his grueling journey, Sam moved from a reactive character to a proactive one. He began the story by taking repeated blows in the training yard, and yet here he is advising King Stannis on the weaknesses of others and whites and manipulating the direction of the Night's Watch leadership, further paying back the early faith Jon Snow showed in him. And most impressive of all, our cowardly huntsman was brave every time he needed to be and thus survived against all odds— We mentioned Sam's early internal and external character goals were to confront fear and survive the Night's Watch, respectively. Well, Sam has achieved both objectives and more. Yet as he comes to the fore, Sam's story is far from complete. And so next up, we'll examine Sam's journey back to his beginnings and the further character growth involved, as well as taking a look at what's in store for him in Old Town and what the purpose of his growth arc might be. But first, let's take a moment to thank our patrons from the Valyrian Steel level. Radio Estros is powered by patrons, and thanks so much to these patrons from the Valyrian Steel level. Aerodo, Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Akka from Ashai, Oxheart, Amber the Adamant, Anna, Hortense of Ashai, Blythe Spirit, Cabot the Unfrozen, Marja the Mage, David, Dean, Drew, Sir Sorcedelica, James K, Lord Zosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Juna of House Aiko, Casey, Lady Silverwing, Infandaris, the Unspeakable Terror, Liam, Boss, the Sothorian, Sally, Sheila, Tristis Lurian, Wild Child of the Wolfswood, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. Your life belongs to the Night's Watch, so go and stuff your small clothes into a sack, along with anything else you care to take to Old Town. You leave an hour before sunrise. And here's another order. From this day forth, you will not call yourself a craven. You've faced more things this past year than most men face in a lifetime. You can face the Citadel, but you'll face it as a sworn brother of the Night's Watch. I can't command you to be brave, but I can command you to hide your fears. When George divided what was to have been the fourth installment of A Song of Ice and Fire into two novels, now the fourth and fifth volumes, he made the decision to do it by character arc, which effectively also segregated the story by geographical location. Book four would involve characters in the South, King's Landing, The Vale, The Riverlands, The Iron Islands, and Dorne, along with a handful of Arya chapters set in Braavos, while Book 5 would cover the North and Essos before weaving a handful of other arcs back into the frame near its ending. 
The single exception to the geographical divide is Samwell's journey to Old Town, which begins in Sam 1, set at the wall, in which Lord Commander Jon Snow tells Sam to prepare to go to the Citadel. The main events of that chapter will be replayed from Jon's POV in A Dance with Dragons, the only time George has shown the same scenes from two different POVs. From Sam's perspective, the chapter begins in the Library of the Night's Watch, deep in the wormways below the wall and Castle Black. He's seemingly been there for days, digging through ancient texts and archives. In spite of his experiences beyond the wall, his newly acquired nickname, Slayer, and his recent triumph in orchestrating the results of the Night's Watch election, he is still Sam at heart, unwilling and even afraid to kill the mice who are eating the precious books of the library. When he emerges from the cellars, he finds himself summoned to John's chamber. The new Lord Commander has need of him. Sam's musings about dragons and dragon eggs at the wall, inspired by thoughts of good Queen Alisande's visit with Silverwing so long ago, are echoed by John when the subject of Melisandre's plans for Mance Raider arises. King's blood to wake a dragon, where Melisandre thinks to find a sleeping dragon, no one is quite sure. It's nonsense. While John dismisses the sleeping dragon, he takes the threat to those who could be said to have King's blood very seriously. Sam's mission in the library has been to discover some specific texts requested by Maester Eamon, and to search for references to the others in the archives. Much of what he's learned merely confirms what they already know from experience, that they are vulnerable to dragonglass or obsidian and do not like fire, that they ride on the corpses of dead animals and raise those they kill as undead thralls, and that the only way to prevent that is to burn the victims' corpses. He does come across two potentially new details. A mention of ice spiders, which seems to support one of the more horrific parts of the stories Old Nan used to tell the Stark children, and another of something called dragon steel. It says, I found one account of the long knight that spoke of the last hero slaying others with a blade of dragon steel. Supposedly, they could not stand against it. Both John and Sam wonder if dragon steel is the same as Valyrian steel, but John still wants more information who the others are, where they come from and what they want. He needs these details to defend the wall and the realms of men from whatever is coming from the far north. Sam thinks he could find it in the archives somewhere given time, but there is no time. Sam is being sent away to Old Town to become John's new maester. He's taking Maester Aemon with him to protect him from Melisandre's need for king's blood for her spells, and unbeknownst to him, John has also arranged to spirit Mance Raider's son away with Gilly as well, just to be safe. These measures have been planned with and approved by Aemon himself, a wise man who saw the danger, though he was blind, and also the need for John to take any steps he could to strengthen the watch while he still had time. When John first mentioned Old Town and the plan to send Gilly and the babe to Horn Hill, Sam's fear of his father was palpable. But, as we said earlier, when John insisted that Sam must study at the Citadel and forge a maester's chain, his fear became outright panic. In a series of frantic and disjointed memories, we learned about Sam's early desire to become a maester and his father's vicious and violent response. Chained to a wall by the neck for three days and nights for expressing a wish to make something of himself, when his father had already shown that in every way he favored Dickon to succeed him? As we said, what a simple solution it would have been, Sam surrendering his claim in favor of his brother and becoming a maester of the Citadel, but for the pride of Lord Randall. Departing Castle Black, which he'd come to think of as his home, its residents, his new family, Sam had no way of knowing that his father had evidently spread some story of his death. Rather, after many months of growth, Sam Tarly is heading south to face his final personal demon. 
His Lord Commander has ordered him to never again call himself Craven and reminded him that his duty is no longer to House Tarly but to the Night's Watch. And so the unlikely group begins its southward journey, heading first to Eastwatch to pick up Darian the Singer and board Blackbird bound for Bravos. Sam, in all practical ways, is in charge of the journey. Eamon is certainly the senior officer, but he's too old and frail to be the leader of the little group. Sam must protect him, as well as Gilly and the babe. But although Sam is left with most of the responsibility and decision-making, aboard Blackbird he wonders about the purpose of his voyage. It says, He did not want to be a maester with a heavy chain wrapped around his neck, cold against his skin. He did not want to leave his brothers, the only friends he'd ever had, and he certainly did not want to face the father who had sent him to the wall to die. The fifth member of the group, Darion, is problematic. During the voyage out, Darion was frequently insolent to Sam, calling him Slayer and treating him with thinly veiled disrespect. In hindsight, perhaps it's no surprise that Darian was less than delighted with the voyage to Old Town, since the incident that saw him sent to the wall in the first place took place at Golden Grove, where Lord Mathis Rowan accused Darion of raping one of his daughters. Though Darion insisted it was consensual, the girl failed to exonerate him and he was sentenced to the watch. It's possible that Old Town, also in the Reach, seemed just a little too close to the scene of the crime and represented too much risk for the singer. Once in Bravos, it becomes clear that Darion has no interest in adhering to his vows or in becoming a recruiter for the Watch as John had commanded him. In spite of Sam's exhortations, Darion spends more and more time in taverns and with sex workers and less time helping Sam. The final straw came as Sam, dealing with a grief-stricken Gilly and a failing Maester Aemon, desperate for coin in order to book passage for the final leg of their journey, and commanded by Aemon to seek out more news of dragons at the docks, sought out his sworn brother at the happy port where he had, of all things for a man of the Night's Watch, wed the woman known as the Sailor's Wife, who was known for only betting men she was married to, even if only temporarily. Along the way, Sam was rescued from a tense confrontation with a pair of bravos by a girl with the barrow of clams, none other than Arya Stark, going by the name Cat of the Canals, the second of Jon Snow's missing siblings that Sam encounters. Arya, or Cat, is aware of Darion and tells Sam where to find him. For his part, Darion undoubtedly has no idea how very dangerous her attention is. As a Stark, she is certain what fate a deserter from the Watch deserves, and so in his final face-off with Sam, Darion unwittingly signs his own death warrant when he declares to Sam, I'm done with you, I'm done with Black. But first, it's Sam's turn. For what might be the first time in his life, Sam strikes someone out of something other than self-preservation. Sheer rage, it says, for once he was too angry to be afraid, leads to Sam punching Darion, and it's possible he wouldn't have stopped if he hadn't been pulled off the smaller man and thrown unceremoniously into a canal. But even that turned out to be a fortuitous incident, since Sam was rescued by Zondo Doru, a Summer Islander, who had witnessed the whole scene. Zondo introduces himself as the mate of the swan ship Cinnamon Wind. He overheard Sam telling Darion they needed to seek out information about dragons from sailors at the docks, and as luck would have it, his captain had seen dragons with his own eyes in Carth. Furthermore, it will turn out that his ship is bound for Old Town. And so an odd combination of Aya's advice and Darion's desertion, the very combination which will lead to Darion's death, leads to Sam finding passage for himself, Gilly and the baby, and Maester Aemon aboard the swan ship captained by Kahuru Mo. Sam's journey aboard Cinnamon Wind is literally a manhood arc. 
With no funds to pay for the journey, Sam is forced to trade many of their possessions, including a collection of rare books Eamon had hoped to present to the library at the Citadel, to pay for their passage. In addition, Sam was required to join the crew in the hard work of being a sailor. It says, He scrubbed decks and rubbed them smooth with stones. He hauled on anchor chains. He coiled rope and hunted rats. He sewed up torn sails, patched leeks with bubbling hot tar, boned fish, and chopped fruit for the cook. While he's making decisions and working hard to protect his small family group, Sam also cares for the ever-failing Eamon, and when his mentor passed during the journey, it was Sam who said the funeral words and directed what must be done with his remains. In a real sense, Sam experienced the rite of passage that comes to all who live to see their elder generation pass on. But perhaps most significantly, after Eamon's death, grief-stricken and drunk on sailor's rum, Sam and Gilly consummate their relationship after many months of unfulfilled yearning. Setting aside all of the many fandom jokes about Sam's fat pink mast, his relationship with Gilly represents one of the last hurdles in his manhood arc. He's able to grow so much in such a short time because aboard Cinnamon Wind, with the Summer Islanders being friendly and supportive, he must feel safe for almost the first time in his life. Even at the wall, he had to contend with bullies. But aboard the ship, no one is cruel, no one discounts his abilities, and everyone seems to simply believe that he is capable of all the tasks being set before him, including being a partner to Gilly. When he left Castle Black, Sam promised Jon Snow that he would continue his archery practice. We know that Sam hates archery. In that same chapter, it says he hated longbow practice almost as much as he hated climbing steps. When he wore his gloves, he could never hit anything, but when he took them off, he got blisters on his fingers. Those bows were dangerous. And yet, he keeps to his word and picks up a bow and arrow aboard Cinnamon Wind. And not just any bow. The Summer Islander's weapon of choice, the Golden Heart Bow, is renowned not only for its range and accuracy, sending their arrows, quote, farther and truer than even Dornish yew, but also for their difficulty being taller and harder to draw than a typical Westerosi longbow. Sam obviously practices enough off-page that when an ironborn longship briefly menaces Cinnamon Wind, he's able to join in the crew's defense with some measure of success. It says, Koja waited until the ship came within 200 yards before she gave the command to loose. Sam loosed with them, and this time he thought his arrow reached the ship. A huge improvement, considering it stated that he rarely hit anything in practice back at Castle Black. Sam also begins to assert himself, questioning the captain of Huntress, the galley that stops Cinnamon Wind for inspection as she enters the Whispering Sound, about the defences of Old Town, a conversation that leads to him wondering about the defences of his family home, and if they are adequate. A Game of Thrones Sam would have never thought to question his father, and yet here he is, second-guessing the arrangements he assumes Randall must have made. And so, when they arrive in Old Town, Sam has a newfound confidence as he disembarks and heads to the Citadel to make Maester Eamon's final arrangements and present the letters John had sent, requesting that he be admitted for study and that the watch be sent Maesters for the restored castles as well. In addition, Sam remains keenly aware of his responsibility to Gilly and the baby. During that final leg of the journey, he had debated the merits of keeping her in Old Town, with the looming threat from the Ironborn, versus asking Kuhuru Mo to take her to the relative safety of the Summer Islands, versus taking her to his childhood home. His decision is made with confidence, reflecting his intelligence and his devotion to keeping Gilly safe. It says... It has to be Horn Hill, Sam finally decided. Once we reach Old Town, I'll hire a wagon and some horses and take her there myself. That way, he could make certain of the castle and its garrison, and if any part of what he saw or heard gave him pause, he could just turn around and bring Gilly back to Old Town. 
At the Citadel, Sam met with the novice Alaras, who took him to meet Archmaester Marwyn. Outside of Marwyn's chambers, Sam met someone from his past, the novice Leo Tyrell, who only recognises Sam after he introduces himself, though it's made clear they knew each other from childhood. Sam's introduction to Leo seems curious, as he used the very nickname he had been given by his black brothers, and which he hated. I went beyond the wall and fought in battles. They call me Sam the Slayer. But perhaps it's not so curious when you recall the fantasy Sam had in that village north of the wall of telling his father about his exploits. In A Storm of Swords, it says, He wondered what his father would say if he could see him now. I killed one of the others, my lord, he imagined saying. I stabbed him with an obsidian dagger, and my sworn brothers call me Sam the Slayer now. Though Sam is sure his father would only laugh, or worse, perhaps his exchange with Leo Tyrell can be viewed as a rehearsal of sorts, as Sam gets closer to Horn Hill and memories of his father's abuse. The Sam Tali who arrived in Old Town in a feast for crows is a far cry from the Sam Tali who arrived at the Wall in A Game of Thrones. His character arc has been about self-discovery and growth, finding himself and his courage, and becoming a man away from the toxic influence of his uber-masculine father. There remains only one barrier to Sam fully realising his development into a man who is confident in himself and his abilities, and that is waiting for him at his childhood home a hundred leagues from Old Town. And so, our final segment will cover all the things that Sam might encounter and achieve in his upcoming journeys. But in the next segment, we're going to take a brief detour into the literary inspiration for this character and what that might tell us about the role Samuel Tarley has to play in A Song of Ice and Fire. But first, here's an advertisement from Westeros. When you choose higher education at the Citadel of Old Town, you're choosing centuries of experience. The best lecturers on everything from Raven Tending 101 to the properties of urine. And the best novice cells in town, yours free if you tend to one of our ancient archmaesters. Extracurricular offerings include archery lessons with a native summer islander, cider at the Quill and Tankard, and instruction in long-distance communication with our glass candle experts. If you've always dreamed that one day you might be allowed to wear the chain and serve the greater good, the Citadel of Old Town is for you. But say nothing of prophecies or dragons unless you fancy poison in your porridge. The Citadel of Old Town, the only choice for discerning Westerosi intellectuals. Please note, in case of grayscale outbreak, remote learning will be implemented. Keep your ravens handy. The concept of the everyman in literature is defined by Wikipedia as a stock character in fiction. An ordinary and humble character, the everyman is generally a protagonist whose benign conduct fosters the audience's wide identification with him. It's easy to see how someone like George, who grew up a comic-loving bookworm in a time where being a nerd was hardly cool, might choose to incorporate a highly relatable character into his masterwork, and every man, or is it every nerd, for the ages, a self-insert from an acknowledged bookworm who could redeem the ordinary into the extraordinary simply by drawing upon his own often scorned or undervalued character traits. Enter Samuel Tarley, who, as we've said, functions largely as a stand-in for the author himself. However, Samwell has another notable influence as well, and every man who stands as a shining beacon of what is possible when an ordinary character reacts to extraordinary circumstances. We're referring, of course, to the relationship of Samwell Tarley to J.R.R. Tolkien's Samwise Gamgee. On one occasion, asked whether Sam Tarley is an intentional homage to Tolkien's Sam, George's response was a tacit affirmative. There are a number of homages to Lord of the Rings in my book. I am a huge Tolkien fan. 
We've actually previously discussed Samwell being an unlikely hero as part of our episode all about the heroic arcs of A Song of Ice and Fire. In the same episode, we mentioned briefly some similarities Samwell Tarly shares with that other famous unlikely hero whose nickname he shares, Samwise Gamgee. Here we'll explore that literary inspiration in further detail, as well as discuss why the two Sams are such beloved and relatable characters, and what their similarities might mean for A Song of Ice and Fire. To understand the importance of Samwise Gamgee to The Lord of the Rings, one must first understand his creator's views on heroism. Over and over again, in letters, Tolkien describes his Sam as rustic and ordinary. His name literally means half-wise or simple, but far from being an indictment of Sam's character, these things highlight traits the author found highly commendable. As a veteran of World War I, Tolkien described a relationship that existed between university-educated officers, which he was, and the batsmen and privates who served beneath them. There was a work ethic present in the latter group born of being drawn from the working classes which he greatly admired and directly transposed onto Samwise, the erstwhile gardener and then manservant to Frodo Baggins. My Sam Gamgee is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates and batsmen I knew in the 1914 war and recognised as so far superior to myself. Tolkien often referred to Sam as a heroic character, even possibly the chief hero of the saga. He admired courage born from love and loyalty, the sort of courage that a character might deny having but is present at key moments, a triumph of the ordinary man over extreme circumstances in which he never thought to find himself. Along with this courage comes a rejection of power, shown in Sam's interactions with the One Ring, and a yearning for the ordinary, as with Sam's oft-stated desire to return to the Shire, wed his Rosie, and tend his garden. Replying to a letter from a fellow Englishman who happened to bear the name Sam Gamgee, Professor Tolkien stated, The Sam Gamgee of my story is a most heroic character, now widely beloved by many readers, even though his origins are rustic. So unequivocally, Tolkien valued the characteristics that Sam embodies and acknowledged that many of his readers did as well. Yeah, whether you agree with the assessment that Samwise Gamgee is the true hero of The Lord of the Rings or not, few could argue that he isn't a heroic character. His simple faith in goodness is embodied in his speech to Frodo in The Two Towers, which ends, There's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. At the same time, his utter devotion to Frodo is encapsulated in the four words he shouts as the Fellowship breaks apart at the end of Fellowship of the Rings. I'm coming, Mr. Frodo. While his stubborn determination is seen in Return of the King, I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. And his sheer grit manifests in the face of an ancient evil represented by Shelob in the Two Towers. Come, you filth. You've hurt my master and you'll pay for it. Sam's bravery in the face of Shelob in particular, but throughout the entire journey into Mordor in general, is a courage that Ned Stark would understand, remembering that early advice to Bran that we've mentioned through the episode. And without Sam's extraordinary courage, born from his entirely ordinary impulses of goodness and devotion, Frodo would not have made it to the endgame, and may in fact have been consumed by the ring. Sam, perhaps more than any other character, contributed to the success of the quest, and by virtue of his simplicity and purity, managed to do so relatively unscathed. Having established that George sees his own Sam as an homage to Tolkien's Sam, as well as Samwise Gamgee's critical role in the saga of Lord of the Rings, let's consider the similarities between the characters and their roles in their respective stories, and what this might mean for Samwell Tarly. 
To start with, the names and descriptions, Samwell and Samwise share an awful lot, in spite of the fact that one of them comes from a human-adjacent race. Both are described as fat and soft, though Samwise is also seen to be physically strong for his size, a characteristic of his rustic origin as a simple farmer or gardener. But both Sams likely experience a physical transformation during their story that isn't immediately evident to either the reader or the character himself. At the end of Return of the King, we see the reactions of Shire residents to the newly returned adventurers, who have become somewhat other and extremely exotic compared to how they were viewed upon their departure. Sam Tarly's change has yet to be revealed fully, but we can expect that his journey south aboard Cinnamon Wind has left him looking rather different than he did when he last set foot in the Reach. As far as their in-story roles go, both Sams are stewards. Samwell, as part of the Order of Stewards in the Night's Watch, mostly in service to Maester Aemon, and Samwise, as Frodo's companion and manservant during their quest from the Shire to Mount Doom and back. Both are framed as loyal friends and companions to a character who is the ostensible protagonist or hero of the story, Tolkien's Frodo, and, as much as there exists a single protagonist in A Song of Ice and Fire, Martin's Jon Snow. Both Sams begin their respective story as quite fearful. Samwell is a self-described craven who is notably shown to be a coward on multiple occasions, afraid of weapons, of blood, of heights, of horses, of mice, of his father and of many of his Night's Watch brothers. In fact, there doesn't seem to be anything Samwell isn't afraid of unless it's books. Samwise Ganji is afraid of Gandalf, of the Black Riders who stalk their journey, of elves, whom he secretly adores, and of orcs, and who wouldn't be? But both end up showing moments of extreme bravery. Samwell during the flight from the Fist of the First Men when he slays that White Walker, and again in the journey from Craster's to the Wall when he defends Gilly at the village that may or may not be White Tree. Sam Wise, in his confrontation with Shelob, with the orcs of Kirith Ungol, and in the role he played in getting Frodo to Mount Doom. And let's face it, with much more to tell in the saga of A Song of Ice and Fire, and Samwell only recently arriving in Old Town, which might soon become one of the more highly dangerous locations in the story, it's entirely possible that Sam Tully's arc has much more heroism to come. In fact, we'd count on it if his determination to continue keeping Gilly and the baby safe from harm is any indication, not to mention the expectation that Sam will be returning to the wall at some point, having gained knowledge and training crucial to the support of the Night's Watch during what will almost certainly be a time of great darkness. So, if Samwell has a significant role to play in the endgame of the new War for the Dawn, it's possible that he will join his literary inspiration, Sam Gamgee, in being numbered amongst the real heroes of their respective stories. And the possibilities for Samwell Tarley's role in the endgame will be covered in our final segment. Will Samwell be there at the bitter end, as Samwise Gamgee was? As George might say... Keep reading. I'm glad you are here with me, here at the end of all things, Sam. In this episode, we've walked through Sam's early feats of bravery and considered his growth arc as he became more independent and confident on his way to Old Town. Now it's time to speculate about the future of his story in The Winds of Winter and Beyond, where we expect Sam to continue his adventure at the Citadel, revisit Horn Hill, and ultimately return to the wall where his story began. And if you like this sort of speculation, don't forget to check out the instalment of The Winds of Winter Primer All About the Reach and the accompanying live stream, where we take an even deeper dive into the future of Sam Tarly. In The Winds of Winter, Sam will first have to familiarise himself with his new surroundings at the Citadel. 
Given Archmaester Marwyn left Old Town in great haste in order to travel to Daenerys and her dragons, Sam will be left to further acquaint himself with the fellow novices we met in Pate's prologue. At the end of Feast, we realize that a faceless man, formerly known as Jack and Hagar, has infiltrated the Citadel in the guise of the novice Pate, perhaps in order to extract information on the killing of dragons. There's Alaris, whose name is Sorella Backwards, likely one of Oberyn Martell's daughters who has followed in her father's footsteps and found her way into the Citadel. Given the fact that Alaris is shown to be proficient with a golden heart bow, such as the one Sam used with Koja Mo aboard Cinnamon Wind, and that, as we said, Sam promised John he would continue to practice his archery and has improved enormously already during his time aboard the Swan Ship, Perhaps Alaris will mentor Sam with a new trick or two, helping him to obtain the skills he'll need to one day be notching and loosing with dragon glass tipped arrows when the war with the others finally arrives. And don't forget to keep eyes on lazy Leo Tyrell, who is shown to be a bully from the outset. Based on their history, he could think Samwell a soft target for his cruel japes, and so witnessing how Sam might stand up for himself will be intriguing and a good marker as to how much his character has grown. While Sam settles in at the Citadel, he'll be attempting to forge a maester's chain as quickly and efficiently as possible, as advised by Marwyn. For one reason or another, he might find himself short of time, and so it's possible he could leave the Citadel as Jon Snow's half-maester, running in parallel with Aegon's half-maester, Halden. Before Sam leaves, though, and more important than linking a full chain, he must seek out and find vital information on the others to bring back to the Wall. Sam could be an integral figure in the battle to save the realms of men if his research proves fruitful. There is power in knowledge, and no one knows this better than George R.R. R. Martin. As Sam surrounds himself with books and scrolls, he must be careful of the situation around Old Town. It's well established in his final chapter aboard Cinnamon Wind that the Ironborn are wreaking havoc along the coast. If Euron makes a play for Old Town, or indeed the Citadel itself, expect to see some of the action through Sam's eyes. And of course, readers will be hoping Sam comes through any such ordeal unscathed. In addition to his time at the Citadel, we also expect Sam to be headed to Horn Hill. In A Storm of Swords, Sam had a dream about revisiting his childhood home. It says, He was back at Horn Hill, at the castle, but his father was not there. It was Sam's castle now. Jon Snow was with him. Lord Mormont, too. The old bear and Gren and Dolorous Ed and Pip and Toad and all his other brothers from the Watch. But they wore bright colors instead of black. Sam sat at the high table and feasted them all, cutting thick slices off a roast with his father's greatsword, Heartsbane. There were sweet cakes to eat and honeyed wine to drink. There was singing and dancing, and everyone was warm. Sam's family dynamics and Randall's treatment of him remain ever-present in Sam's thoughts. Such is the depth of the damage inflicted upon him. Given Sam has been showing improvement and growth throughout his story, perhaps this dream is leading towards some sort of showdown with his father. A confrontation would certainly be a surefire way to gauge internal progress and for Sam to make further headway in his manhood story. But since Sam thinks that his father would only scowl in disbelief at his exploits north of the Wall, we can guess that trying to please or impress Randall Tarley could be a pointless task, and therefore Sam must realize that ultimately his father's opinion should not sway him or frighten him any further. He'll have to find ways of somehow besting Randall with his wits alongside his newfound courage. And so we wonder if perhaps the first line of description in the dream is the most telling. His father was not there, it says. There's a strong possibility that if Sam goes directly to Hornhill as he plans, his father might not be there at all to begin with. He's currently in King's Landing, serving on Tom and Small Council after all. But there could still be some danger waiting for Sam there, perhaps justifying the anxiety about the Ironborn that he felt when he considered bringing Gilly and the baby there. 
Sam thinks a lot about the defences of his family seat, and when he decides to go ahead with a plan to bring Gilly there, he resolves that he will personally make certain of the castle and its garrison. We've seen Sam growing more confident in his knowledge and abilities. As Tyrion proved at the Blackwater, one needn't be a renowned warrior to mount an effective defence of a place. Perhaps one way Sam could prove himself to his father would be through successfully overseeing the defence of Hornhill during an attack of some sort. Speaking of Hornhill, Randall is not the only member of Sam's family he's due to be reacquainted with. Sam's mother, Melissa, will surely be delighted to have him home and to potentially meet Gilly and the baby, who Sam might pass off as his own biological son. There remain question marks as to what Randall told Melissa about Sam's fate, and if she had been duped into believing that Sam had died, the interfamily dynamics could be awkward and complicated. This tense situation is unlikely to be comfortable for Sam, but there could be satisfying resolutions to his long-standing familial problems leading to further character growth. Earlier in the episode, we mentioned that there was speculation surrounding why the other near the Fist of the First Men chose to attack Sam and his companions. One theory is that the other was searching for the Horn of Joraman, which is rumoured to have the power to bring down the wall. Whether Sam's old war horn is indeed the Horn of Joraman is open for debate, and so readers will be paying close attention to the horn, last seen with Sam in Bravos and apparently still in his possession. One thing is for certain, George has chosen to bring the old war horn south, and so there must be a reason. Will Sam show the horn to his tutors at the Citadel? Will Euron steal it and use it for his own savage schemes? Or could the old war horn be a red herring? The fandom awaits answers with bated breath. Eventually, though, we expect Sam to make the long journey back to Lord Commander Jon Snow at Castle Black. Unbeknownst to Sam, Jon was stabbed, perhaps to death, by his own men at the end of A Dance with Dragons. And despite the likelihood that he'll be resurrected, there remain many questions as to how news of Jon's ostensible death might affect Sam's plans. Given the importance of Sam's role as chief researcher of the Long Night, he'll likely return north no matter what, and how the Night's Watch employs the information he'll bring back with him is one of a host of intriguing questions in the minds of readers as we contemplate an attack by the others. But before mankind faces off with the zombie apocalypse, Sam has some unfinished business up north. First of all, murdered Lord Commander Jor Mormont confided his final wish to Sam when, with his dying breath, he told Tali to tell my son, Jorah, tell him, take the black. My wish, dying wish, tell Jorah, forgive him. Clearly offering Jorah a chance at forgiveness and redemption for his sin of selling poachers into slavery. With Jorah currently thousands of miles to the east in Slaver's Bay, don't expect a resolution to this plot thread anytime soon. However, further down the timeline, Jorah may well yet find himself up north if Daenerys takes him back into her service and one day travels to the Wall with her dragons in order to fight the others. Whether Jorah will heed his father's wishes remains to be seen, but taking the black might be a fitting conclusion to the torrid affair which saw him banished from the Seven Kingdoms by Ned Stark. There is certainly a road to redemption for Jorah if he chooses to take it and honour his father. And who knows, if Jon Snow obtains a new Lightbringer sword, Jorah might even get Longclaw back. And finally... Sam has further unfinished business with Bran Stark. Cold Hands made Sam swear not to tell a soul about Bran's whereabouts, as he took the Stark child and his companions to a mysterious cave in the far north. Sam must now hide this fact from Jon Snow if he's to keep his word, but there's always the possibility that Bran and Sam will share scenes somewhere in the story's future. Given that Sam is collecting knowledge concerned with 
defeating the others, and that Bran will likely be doing the same thing via the Weirnet, these two characters could have some rather interesting conversations which could potentially swing the balance of war away from the undead and toward humanity. In addition, there remains a possibility that both Sam and Bran might share some other revelations of a less supernatural sort. Beside the elusive Howl and Reed, there are no characters more likely to uncover information that, when pulled together, might finally reveal the truth about Jon Snow's parentage. And so, Samuel Tarly, an unlikely yet worthy hero, one who has faced fears from a brutal father to a supernatural foe, and grown as a character before our eyes, could very well be poised to become one of the central figures of the saga when all is said and done. Like Samwise Gamgee and the Cowardly Lion, Samuel Tarly will find a way to embody the idea that heroes come in all shapes and sizes, and prove that even a young man who is called craven and fat and so many other horrible things designed to tear him down might just make all the difference to the story in the end. A maester forges his chain with study. The different metals are each a different kind of learning. Gold for the study of money and accounts, silver for healing, iron for warcraft. The collar is supposed to remind a maester of the realm he serves. Lords are gold and knights steel, but two links can't make a chain. You also need silver and iron and lead tin and copper and bronze and all the rest and those are farmers and smiths and merchants and the like a chain needs all sorts of metals and a land needs all sorts of people Thanks so much for joining us for this episode all about Sam Tarley. And for more Samwell content, please check out our friends over at Girls Gone Canon who have just embarked on a chapter-by-chapter -chapter reread of Sam's Point of View arc. And we'll be back soon with a new regular episode in which we'll be examining the last three sitting Targaryen kings. And now, as always, it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to George R.R. R. Martin for putting so much of his own heart and soul into A Song of Ice and Fire. And thanks to Kevin McLeod and Kai Angle for allowing us to use their music in our production. And as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Sincere thanks to Yvonne, Quarren Halfhand, Virginie, Hema Helmet, the Sellsword Sentinel, Theo, the Cannibal of Casterly Rock, the Tattered Princess, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, Terry, Cern, Sherry, Sir Swift, the Peppered Knight from the House of Black and Grey, Sir Daniel, the Sneaky Russian, Scott Greenseer, Sarah, Sam, Richard, Paul H. and Paul B., Philip, PJ, Peter Pebble, Patrick, anime lover Nicole, Mitchell, Michael, Maester Mary, Melinda, Lady Beatrix of House Grey, and our cohort of Matts, Matt A., Matt C., Matt K., and Matt L., Margareta, Maria, Monaro Geek TV, Lemmy B, Lemba, Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, Knight of the Laughing Tree, Sir Galahoo of What, Tree Girl, Brash Candy, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Catherine, Judson, Julie Beth of Tarth, John Aris, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Sonarion, the White Storm, Winter's King, Jim McGeehan, Goldie Juke, Brendan B. Fish, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Ingvild, History of Westeros, Greg, Sir Gladworth, Felix, Ezra, Emily of the Eerie, Esme, Eric, Direwolf, Dennis, Dimitri B., Dan the Good, Dan S., Sir Archibald Cadogan, Convenience or Death, Sir Duncan Cole, Clay, Maddie and Jessica, Christine, Christian, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Casey, Camille, Brian, Oakenfist, Amber, Ali B., Ali C., Alex, Aegon the Sixth, and AJ. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit Radio West.